We are moving on now to uh, the second part of our vocal lecture, uh, vocal part two. And this is the only time that I've planned to really kind of go in depth on this piece of equipment that you're looking at right now. This is the Focusrite ISA 430, and it is actually several tools in one. For one thing, you can tell that this is an honest-to-goodness hardware unit. It is not a piece of software living on your laptop. Uh, when you record vocals more than anything else, vocals are the one thing that quite often get tracked or recorded while using uh, compression. Now, not everybody does this, but quite a few people do. And the idea of compression is simply to gently limit the peaks so that the, the loudest portions are rolled off just a little bit. And when you roll off those louder portions, you can then turn the overall signal up higher. In other words, uh, without compression, your signal might be peaking at negative 10, and uh, you don't want to go any higher than that. But maybe the average signal is riding down around negative 20, and you really wish you had a little bit higher average signal, but you're afraid to go past that negative 10 threshold. Well, with compression, you can roll that off so that your peak ends up dropping down to somewhere like negative 16. And then you can turn your overall volume up by 6 decibels, and that gets you your average signal louder. But this is the compressor area, and um, we're going to talk in more in detail about that in just a minute. Now, this unit is also a mic preamp. Um, so just like your audio interface, there is a gain knob um, and uh, kind of a couple of gain controls here. And also phantom power, if you needed to turn it on for a condenser mic, you'd have phantom power. I'm using the uh, SM7B by Shure, which is the dynamic mic right now, so I don't need phantom power. Uh, this is um, a very flexible piece of equipment because it also lets me switch between four different types of impedances. And each one of those is, is pretty subtle, but um, I'm on the highest impedance right now, which gives me um, the sharpest, brightest, loudest sound, which I think I kind of need with this particular microphone. But I could play around with it if I want to. I could step through these impedances. Right now I'm using the low impedance. That should have changed the sound the most dramatically. Now I'm going to start stepping back toward the high. Here's my second setting getting a little higher, and I'm going to go up until the medium setting, which gets a little higher, and finally we're going to go back up to the highest setting, which is the highest impedance, the brightest, clearest sound. Um, this is all part of the preamp function, and um, this is a flexibility here that very few other preamps, never will you see that offered in a standard audio interface preamp, so this is really kind of considered a boutique high-end channel strip. In fact, um, a channel strip like this is what you would usually see in a large recording studio where they have those gigantic mixing boards. Uh, what you're looking at here are, are all the controls that you would expect to see in just one channel strip of one of those big, huge studios. So a studio like ours is little, and we can afford to have one channel of all these tools, whereas a huge studio might have 128 channels of these types of tools. But the nice thing is, once you get to master one of these, you pretty much understand how all the channel strips of a huge board works. So this particular preamp um, has a little bit of a color to it. It is uh, an analog preamp. And a lot of people really like the Focusrite preamps. It is not tube, however, so it's going to have a different sound quality uh, than a tube preamp. So uh, uh, right now we're talking about preamps as if they are standalone devices, even though up to this point all of our preamps have been integrated with an audio interface or a mixing board. But yes, you can buy them standalone, and when you do, you're spending a lot more money, and usually you're getting a specific sound. Um, the reason this is a little bit controversial is because you can also just record with a fairly clean sounding preamp and then get those, um, those colors with uh, different plugins when you're mixing. Uh, and then you can always swap them out. You can decide that you wanted to change one and get a different one or whatever. 
But for those folks who really know for sure that they like what a certain preamp is doing for a certain application, it makes sense to pick one if you have it at your disposal and, um, and stick with that during the tracking process. So we have our preamp section, we have our compressor, compressor section, and let me go ahead and turn the compressor on. In fact, I'm going to move uh, the selector for this meter off of the input so it's no longer going to be bouncing while I'm talking, and instead it's going to only bounce when the compressor is working. So let's come over here and uh, see if I can't get my compressor to kick in a little bit. Check one, two. Okay, now you see that the needle is moving in the opposite direction of the uh, original um, metering. Whereas before it was showing you how much level was coming in to the unit as I spoke, now it is showing you how much reduction in the peaks is happening. So as I'm talking, you see that just about every word is getting about five decibels of reduction. The theory here, of course, is that you can then turn up your volume by that much. And this is going to be good for several reasons. For one thing, when a soloist, uh, a vocal soloist, is monitoring themselves, it's just going to make it easier for them to hear themselves. Um, you know, they're going to be, uh, the average signal level is going to be louder without it clipping or going over the, the max level. So they're going to be able to hear themselves easier once their vocal has been compressed. Odds are, as long as you don't overdo it, and this is something that uh, we'll talk about in a minute, uh, a little bit of compression is going to help control the dynamics anyway, and vocals are among the most dynamic sounds that you're going to be trying to fit into a mix. So a little bit of light compression, where you're not just slamming it, and let's take a look real quick at what slamming it would look like, by the way. Um, I'm going to come to my threshold, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two, check. So now what you're seeing is, as every time I speak, I'm getting over 20 decibels of, of gain reduction. And that is uh, really <laughs> probably way too much. Okay, and so now we're back to something a little bit more normal, where I'm averaging between 3 and 5 dB of, of reduction. Now you can also uh, play with your uh, ratio of compression. We were just talking about the threshold, but the ratio also has something to do with that. And um, the more gentle the ratio for this application, the better. So somewhere like 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 or 4 to 1, but nothing as extreme as 10 to 1. And that just uh, means how rapidly the peak gets turned down. The threshold decides at what point the peak starts to get turned down. The ratio describes uh, how rapidly it gets turned down. And something like 10 to 1 is almost like just a flat line. You hit it, and there's, there's no more room for uh, the signal to grow. But with a 2, 3, or 4 to 1 ratio, that signal uh, still gets turned down, but not like a brick wall. Um, it still can rise. It just won't rise as quickly or as, uh, as intensely. So we also have, uh, in addition to the, the, the analog preamp, which has its own kind of color, and the compressor, which has its own kind of color and also volume uh, control, we have a huge uh, array of EQ. If I come over here and click on Filter In and All EQ, I have now a adjustable bass roll-off. So as I'm talking and turning this up, you're going to be able to hear that the bass is going to come out of my voice, and that's maxed out. So a whole lot of bass is gone at that point. Um, too much for any application I can think of. So the general rule of thumb here is uh, if you're not wanting to use your bass roll-off built into the microphone, you can just turn this up until you hear the lowest of the lows start to come out. And a lot of times people will, as soon as they hear it, they'll even back back off a little bit because they don't want to overdo it. Uh, once you've filtered the lows out, it's really hard to get something back in that sounds good. So you only want to get rid of the really, really low stuff like 40, 50, 60, 70 hertz. And even though the bass roll-off will go way up above 100, um, you better be sure that that's what you want to commit to.